the first time you use Mathematica, you are going to get a welcome screen. And I'm going to open up Mathematica again so that we see that welcome screen and get to take a look. And you get this welcome screen here and you get a button and you can hit it to generate a new document. Now what you'll see is a blank screen and you'll have this horizontal cursor and if you whenever you see that horizontal cursor that means that it's not in a cell in the notebook but if you just start typing so for instance if I type 2 plus 2 Mathematica is automatically going to assume that this is an input cell and with that input cell I can then, as long as my cursor is in that cell, I can hold down shift and I can hit enter and that cell will execute. So now everyone should be able to execute a basic Mathematica command executing 2 plus 2. Mathematica notebooks have a large variety of cell types and as you can see we're actually working in a Mathematica notebook here and you can see the cell structure showing up along the side. At the top we've got a chapter selection, we have text cells, we've got bullet points. All of these different styles can be made in Mathematica and there are a variety of ways to generate those different cell types. Now again starting always with this horizontal cursor I could go up to the format menu of Mathematica and pick and select style and I could enter a style that I want. So now I can have my chapter cell right here. Another option that I can do is I can right click and there's an insert new cell option and I could pick out the cell type that I want so I could put in my section heading and then finally a number of the cell types are mapped to sh keyboard shortcuts Alt 1 through Alt 9. Alt 1 is always a title cell and I believe Alt 9 in this case is input. Am I right? Yes, Alt 9 is always input in this case. So these are kind of the first steps that you need to start interacting with Mathematica in the notebook format. Next up we want to cover some of the basic computations, basic calculations that you'll do in Mathematica. As mentioned above, whenever you have an input cell and your cursor is in that input cell, you can hold down shift and put enter. So here we calculate that 2 plus 2 is equal 4. You can do all kinds of things in Mathematica and we're not possibly going to touch on all the functionality that's built in, but as a few common examples that Mathematica is known for, we can execute this plot command and generate a plot of the sense of the cinch function and we could solve an equation coming up with in this case three different solutions to this equation for possible values of y and we could even create interactive tools so here generating a contour plot that is determining the potential uh, lines lines of constant potential between two point charges we can I address what those two charges are and move them around each other. So we should now be comfortable executing some basic commands in Mathematica, but we really want to focus on what is the structure of Mathematica. And here I want to mention that this, uh, that the Wolfram language, the language that powers Mathematica, is a functional language. So here we have a plot function and we know it's a function call because it has these square braces for the arguments that are being passed to the function. And we have two sub-expressions, sine of x and x, uh, the list x, 0, and 10. So here in this case, sine of x is defining the function to be plotted, and x, 0, 10 is defining the range over which to plot. But these sub-expressions are themselves Mathematica expressions. We will often refer to sub-expressions when we want to or refer to an individual piece of code. So in this example I might say the sub-expression sine of x. The last item that we talked about in the previous slide was a list and a list is what I would call a very special type of function in Mathematica or the Wolfram language. Um, so it, uh, the braces here that you see, these curly braces, uh, are a special notation because lists are so common in Mathematica. So technically a list is the list function. 
the bracket notation in this case is simply a shorthand. So once I have a list, and here I'm assigning that list to a symbol A, I can access individual elements of the list with the part function. So here we've picked out the third element of our list A, and that turns out to be 3.4. There's a shorthand for part, that is the double square brace notation that you see right here. So A, open square brace, open square brace, four, close square brace, close square brace. We'll pick the fourth element of A. And you're going to see me execute a clear function. It's a common issue in the Wolfram language that if you work in it for a long time and you aren't being very careful about cleaning up your definitions, you might run into what we often call definition leak further on. Now, when we talk about Mathematica expressions, eventually we have to get down to an item that is the base item out of which we build further expressions. And we refer to those base items as atoms. So here, I have created a list of atoms. We can use the head function to identify what those items are. So here, I'm going to map the head function to each element, and we find that B, this is just a symbol, that the number 2 is an integer, the number 2.3 is a real, the number 4 divided by 5 is a rational number, that 2 plus 3i is a complex number, and the string hello is registered as a string. Now, um, w one should be aware that when we classify a number as an integer or real or rational or complex, this isn't strictly a mathematical classification. This is referring to the underlying representation in Mathematica. It is true that all integers are members of the reals, but in Mathematica we represent an integer differently than we represent more general reals. We can always test if something is atomic with the atom q function, as we see here. So again, I'm going to clear out my list to make sure I don't have any definition leak further on down. So I wanted to go over lists because we're going to start looking at pattern matching. And the cases function acting on a list is probably the best tool to get started with pattern matching. The first item I want to introduce to you is the blank function. The blank function stands in for any single item. And so we're going to find all the cases in this list that are single items. And what you'll see is we get back the same list. And the reason for that is, is that one is a single item, one point is a single item, one point plus i is considered a single item, one divided by two is considered a single item, and the list of b and c is considered a single item. Even though there are two items in the list, the list itself is a single item. Now, there's a shorthand for the blank function, which is a single underscore, and we're going to get back the same result as you see here. One thing we can do once we have the blank function is we can specify what kind of head we're looking for. So in this case, we are going to be looking for an integer. And we represent that by an underscore followed by the label integer. And that will look through the whole list of items and look for anything that has the head of integer. In this case, we're going to return the single element, 1. Not one point, even though that 1 is an integer, the representation is again of a real. And 1 plus i is not an integer, 1 divided by 2 is not an integer, the list is not an integer, a symbol is not an integer, and a string is not an integer. Um, we can search for any other kind of head that we're interested in, so we could search for symbol, and we get back the raw symbol. One thing you'll notice is that b and c were not selected. The reason for this is that by default, the cases function is only going to look at what we would refer to as one level of depth. So it's going to look for anything in here, and this sublist is just going to have the head of list. We can specify a depth as a third argument to cases, and here we do just that. When we specify a number without putting any braces around it, that means we search down to depth 2, but in including previous levels. So b was identified as a symbol, c was identified as a symbol, and then the word symbol was identified as a symbol and those three all were returned. If I wanted to change this and only look at depth two, I would put my two in a list. And then it would only find B and C because symbol is sitting at depth one instead.
I could look for arbitrary objects. They don't have to be atoms. I could look for a list, for instance, and I get back the list BC. Lastly, we don't have to look for just atoms. We can look for more complex expressions as well. So here we're looking for anything with the head of a list. And when I execute it, as you can see, we get back the list that contains the elements B and C. We can go far more complex, though, when we're looking for patterns. We don't have to necessarily look for a single item. We could look for sets of items. We could look for a list of items. And so here we're going to go over some of the many ways we can look for more complex patterns. In this case, I've got a list of sublists. The 2, hello, 3, 4, 5, 6, goodbye, 7, again, 8, 9, 10, before, and 11. And then here, I'm specifying the pattern that I want to find. This is a pattern where I have one item, then a string, and then one item. So we're going to execute this, and we're going to find that only one element is returned, and that is the 10 before and 11. The 10 counts as a single item, before is a string, and 11 counts as a single item. We don't take the other cases, so for instance, 2, that's a single item, followed by hello, which is a string, but then 3 and 4 are not a single item at the end, so that was rejected. Similarly, having the 5 and the 6 at the start of this list rejected it from fulfilling our pattern, and then having nothing before our string in the third case rejects it from being uh, associated with this pattern, being agreeing with this pattern. If we want to increase the flexibility, we actually have further tools that we can use. So in this next case, we're going to use the blank sequence, which is represented by a double underscore. And that means one or more items. So if I apply that here, we're also going to include the 5, 6, goodbye, and 7, because 5 and 6 it counts as one or more items before the string. Again, it doesn't take the 2, hello, 3, 4, because we only allowed for a single item at the end. And it's not taking, again, 8, 9, because there are 0 items before the string shows up in that sublist. If I put double underscores on both the beginning and the end of the string pattern, we'll find that we're also now picking up the 2, hello, 3, 4 list. Finally, we have the blank null sequence, and a blank null sequence means zero or more items. So let's, and it's represented by a triple underscore. So now let's see how this execution comes out. We get the first two items from our list because they both have uh, one or more items on both in front of and behind the string in their ordering, but we also pick up again eight nine because nothing being before the string counts as zero or more items, which agrees with the blank null sequence. Patterns uh, can fulfill a lot of different roles in Mathematica, and pattern matching can be used in many different ways, and we're going to go over some of those ways now. So first off, we're going to apply a condition function. So here, let's take a look at the full form here. We get a pattern of A being a blank. And what we do with this is that we're setting a label up. And this label A can now be a stand-in later on. So let's take a look at the, this new cases argument. Here we have a list of items. Again, we should recognize that from before. And we say that we are looking for Q. And this slash semicolon, this refers to the condition. And you could read this off as any Q such that the square of Q is greater than 0.5. So when I execute this, I get 1 and 1 point back. So 1 squared is 1, and that's going to be measured as greater than 0 0.5. 1 point squared is going to be 1, uh, is going to be measured as 1 point, and that'll be, again, determined to be greater than 0 0.5. A half squared would come out as a fourth, and that's not going to be greater than 0 0.5. A list cannot be compared to a number. So it was rejected, a symbol cannot be compared, and a string cannot be compared to a number, so they were rejected as well. Another tool that operates in a very similar manner is the pattern test. Here we're going to see a, an example of the pattern test where we use a blank, a question mark, and the number Q function. The question mark is referring to the pattern test function, and it's followed by the number Q function. And you can use any function you like with the pattern test so long as that function returns true or false. 
and we're going to accept in this case only those items which return true from number Q. So 1, 2, 3.5, and 4 are all numbers, and they returned true, and so they were included in our cases statement. X and Y in this case are symbols and are not considered numbers and returned false, and thus were not selected. One of the primary uses for patterns in Mathematica is in the definitions of functions. So here we're going to take a look at one key example. Here we're going to define a function h. h is going to have a single argument. This x underscore means it can take anything. And the result is going to be that we square what we pass into it. So I execute that line of code, and now we have this definition for h. The head of the function is h, and it's going to be able to be passed a single argument. Here we're going to pass in the number 2, and we're going to find that it gets squared to come back as x squared. And that works rather well. Unfortunately, we can pass anything we want in for x. So in this case, we find that hello is being squared. And we could even find that our graphic gets squared. Let me make that a little bit bigger for everyone to see. So it's can be a little odd to try to take the square of a graphic, and Mathematica certainly doesn't know a way to evaluate that further. Here we can start using patterns for type specification. Let's take a look at this other example. We're going to define a function x h1, which will take a single argument, but that argument must have a head of real, and we're going to square that argument. So now when I apply h1 to the string goodbye, it's not going to evaluate. The reason is that there is no definition of h1 that accepts a string as its argument. It must accept a real. So now when I pass 2.3, 2.3 squares successfully. Unfortunately, because we have specified reals, we have not included integers or complex numbers or any other kind of number, only reals being accepted. So if we want to include all possible numeric types, we're going to make use of our pattern test. So in the definition of h2 here, we're going to take any value x with the pattern test that numeric q returns true, so that we get a numeric value back. So now we can take h2 of 2.3, we can take h2 of 2, we can take h2 of i, and we can take h2 of the string my name is Jason, and only in the last case does it not evaluate, because a string is not considered numeric. Another very useful uh, application of patterns is in replacement. So we might be concerned with data that has been entered by various people, and it might be entered in different ways. So we have several numbers, but then we end up with some people wrote in n slash a when data was not available, some people wrote in na when data was not available. And so this might get assigned to our data symbol in the, that list, and we are going to use a function called replace all, and that is represented by a slash dot. And we're going to say any a such that a is a string is going to be replaced with zero dot. So now we've successfully replaced our strings with zeros going on in here. Another way to accomplish this is to do a pattern that incorporates the whole list. In this case, we're going to look for any number of items a followed by a string, followed by any number of items C, and replace it with just A and C. And you'll note in this case that we still have the NA hanging around. And the reason for that is that this rule was only applied once. It identified the numbers 1.234, 3.768, and 2.0 as being A, any number of items before a string, N slash A as a single string that was filled in for B, and C was identified as in A, as we see above. This rule was applied once, and A and C got put back together, and we were left with the in A uh, possibility. To address this kind of issue, there is the replace repeated function. Now it's represented by a slash slash dot, and it will apply the rules available to it as many times until there is no further change. So in this case, we first applied the rule once and got back the list that had NA at the end. But then the rule was applied again, and the NA was identified as a string and removed once again. 
So in this case, replace repeated, because it was able to apply the rule multiple times, was able to identify all the strings in there. One should be exceptionally careful with the replace repeated function. It is very possible, and I have many times myself made the mistake of using replace repeated with a rule that would never stop making a change to my list, and it never ended. So I ended up with a computer that was constantly chugging.